Good afternoon. Um, my name is Amy Lind. I'm, uh, I hold the position of Mary Ellen Heinz Associate Professor in the Department of Women's Gender and Sexuality Studies in the McMicken College of Arts and Sciences. It's a mouthful. Um, I'm very glad to be here. Identity is performed. Identity is historically uncertain and changes over time. Identity is negotiated. These are all ideas that we've learned thus far in the Life of the Mind series in identity. Has an interdisciplinary social scientist who studies processes of globalization and development in the Americas and in the global south, I think about how identity is both an embodied experience and historically and culturally constructed. I also think about how notions of identity are embodied in broader processes of structural change. Identity is to some extent sh shaped by the conditions we're born into, yet identity is something we constantly negotiate, actively express, and signify with new meaning over time. We conform to identity at times, the Borg being an extreme example of that. We resist or re-signify identity at other times. Um, in this way, I'm interested in thinking about the relationship between identity and structure, or how people's subjective experiences of their identities um, arise out of the, a broader set of conditions, yet also how people negotiate those broader sets of conditions. Identity is mediated through culture, through economic markets, through discourse, through politics. Who are you? You are not yourself. These ideas about who we are come out of um, historical processes by which ideas about gender, ideas about race, ideas about sexuality, the family, religion, nationality, have been very, in very concrete ways constructed through science, through various modernization processes that shape in many ways who we are today. Um, in this sense, identity is constantly changing and it's constantly under dispute. Again, a theme that I think was brought up in the last uh, Life of the Mind series on identity. Um, as Judith Butler says, identity is performatively constituted by the very expressions that we, um, that are said to be its results by the very ways in which we express ourselves on a daily basis, from the moment we wake up in the morning to deciding what we wear, to how we present ourselves to the world. These are ways in which our identity is performed and how we perform our identity. Body politics is central to this idea of thinking about identities and how identity is affected by broader processes of change and how we respond to those broader processes. Body politics are the practices and policies through which powers of society regulate the human body. It gives us this idea that bodies and identities are themselves battlegrounds, right? And not in just the most explicit ways, but also through seemingly benign policy frameworks, um, perhaps not so seemingly benign laws, through various cultural, social processes that, that, um, that draw upon ideas of identity that are under dispute. So if one feels unrepresented, then certainly those processes are not benign, and certainly this has been the center, this has been a battleground historically um, for a very long time and continues to be in, in the present day when we think of the various kinds of ethnic conflict, religious-based conflict, the so-called uh, war against women in the United States, um, the meanings that we give to identity are very much at the center of these broader struggles. So to think about this scale matters, and why does it matter? Um, if we think about sovereignty, if we think about westernization, consumerism, colonialism, globalization, nationalism, and certainly in recent years, the idea of national security, citizenship. All of these broad processes 
are very much related to the embodied and tangible, intimate aspects of everyday life. And certainly people who have felt excluded from these broad processes in one way or another have brought that to our attention, right? Um, so how and why do people respond to broad structural change? People's embodied experiences shape their responses to change. This can occur in a number of ways. It can occur through resistance. It can occur through conformity. Uh, it can occur through resignification. That is, giving new meaning to old societal norms or to hegemonic norms in a way that we appropriate a, a, a hegemonic meaning and make it our own. We reclaim identities, and we certainly see this occurring in social movements all the time. Um, so just to give you a couple of examples from my own research in Latin America, one of the most well-known examples um, is that of the mothers who have fought for uh, the reappearance of their disappeared children in the context of military authoritarian regimes. The mothers of the Plaza de Mayo in Argentina are the, by far the most well-known group of women who were not did not consider themselves politically active um, in any sense of the word, who lost their sons and daughters, husbands, family members, community members, neighbors, um, in the so-called dirty war in Argentina from 1976 to 1983, um, when approximately over 30,000 people were disappeared. Uh, these women were courageous enough to go out into a public space, the Plaza de Mayo, which is right in front of the presidential palace, um, to march in pairs of two, because at that time it was illegal to march in more than pairs of two, or to, to convene in more than groups of two. Um, two by two by two by two, adding up to thousands of mothers who would arrive to the Plaza de Mayo, put on their handkerchiefs, have the names of their disappeared children embroidered on their handkerchiefs that they wore as scarves, um, holding photos of the disappeared, making a claim on motherhood, right? Mothers as protectors of the nation, but mothers as politically active citizens who wish to remake the nation. They did not dress like this at home. They arrived at the Plaza de Mayo, put on their tea dresses, performed their motherhood as a way to challenge the authoritarian state and as a way to essentially remake the nation. Another kind of example um, has to do with how beauty standards are become terrains of dispute for much broader struggles concerning sovereignty, westernization, and globalization. Um, in an example from Ecuador, where I've done a lot of my own research, uh, Miss Ecuador 2009, um, very much uh, uh, a kind of Western, Northern uh, standard of beauty. And on the other side, you see a protest of a group of indigenous women who protested the Miss World pageant, which I think is a Donald Trump pageant, that was held in Quito, Ecuador in 2009. So you see there, uh, uh, and certainly in the protest, it was not just about gender. It was about a variety of issues that had to do with identity in a post-colonial context. Um, more broadly in Ecuador, uh, we see a very interesting example that we're seeing throughout the region of the shift to the left. Uh, two thirds of the region has shifted away from the global kind of hegemonic um, economic model has a way to seek sovereignty for nations and has a way to seek an alternative to neoliberal policies. Rafael Correa, who's pictured in the upper left corner, the president of Ecuador, who's a trained economist, uh, is one amongst many leaders who have, in a variety of ways, <coughs> attempted to create a different kind of economic sovereignty for the nation. What you see on the right side is, is a, a manifestation of people supporting Correa and this project, people who have had hope for a new kind of nation. Um, uh, 
At the same time, there has been resistance in that process. Not everyone has been included. Once again, whether it be right wing, left wing, capitalist, socialist, or some combination thereof, people are often not always represented in a national project. In this case, this just happened in March of this year, there was a so-called March for Life where over 10,000 indigenous people and their allies marched from the Amazon region of Ecuador to the capital city of Quito, which is quite a long march, um, to protest the Correa administration's development policies, specifically as they have affected indigenous communities. The indigenous community once again, or communities, once again feels left out of the nation state's project. Um, so what can we draw from these examples that I've highlighted kind of the gender and the ethnic aspects of um, both marginalization, um, resignification, uh, conformity to, and resistance to hegemonic norms that are based on ideas about identity and embedded in these broader processes? Well, first of all, our subjective experiences of identity shape how we respond to structural change. I always think of how two individuals who come from very similar backgrounds, one might feel marginalized or discriminated against, the other person might not. You know, how do we account for those differences? This has to do with subjectivity as well as what's happening in terms of these broader material, social conditions. Um, so these various kinds of responses from resistance to conformity um, and resignification, I think, kind of captures the different ways that people respond to these processes. What certainly tends to happen is that um, identity is often um, homogenized, in a sense, or is seen as implicit in broader uh, analyses of politics, of economic change, of, of governance, of financial markets. And when, that, when it is not broken down, um, uh, many people's lives are at stake. Hence, the fact that people struggle for and against particular policy frameworks or particular notions of how the family is defined in a given context. Um, um, in order to be able to do this better, we need to rescale our analyses. We need to think, we need to make the connections between qualitative and quantitative forms of scholarship. We need to think about these historical and cultural constructions of, of identity as they inform our work today. I'm thinking of how notions of identity that come out of the period of colonialism in Europe very much informs how we think about democracy today and how people are or are not included in these projects. Thank you.